Very special day. Doesn't happen uh, frequently in the life of a college, but uh, it's a big one for us. As we install Mark Sargent as our provost. Um, it's time to celebrate. It's a time to be reverent and uh, thoughtful about what we're here to do. And it's also time to turn off any kind of electronic device that might just uh, act independently of your will during this service. So check your, check your phones, your whatever else you might have. Calling us to order, Andrea and Bradford Sargent. Psalm 139, verses 23 through 24. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Micah 6, verse 8. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Please rise to join in the singing of the processional hymn. seated for the invocation. Our Father in heaven, you sent your one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. And he has promised that wherever two or three gather in his name, he will be there. Lord, we believe you're present with us. We worship you. We hunger for your truth. We long for your light. And we pray that you will be pleased with the things we say and do, that indeed the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts and the promises we make will be pleasing to you, our rock and our redeemer. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Reading from the Gospel of St. Luke, the fourth chapter. Una lectura del Santo Evangelio según San Lucas, el cuarto capítulo. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. وعاد يسوع إلى أقليم الجليل بقوة الروح القدس، وانتشرت أخباره عبر مناطق الأرياف كلها. He was teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. 친히 그 여러 회당에서 가르치심에 못 사람에게 칭송을 받으시더다. He went to Nazareth where he had been brought up and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue as was his custom. He stood up to read and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. 그는 이제 와 나사렛 라 알데 돈데 크레시오 페 코모 데 코스튬브레 알라 시니가그 El día de descanso. O wakafa le yakra, fa atu hukte ban nabi ashaye. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. 주의 성령이 내게 임하셨으니 이는 가난한 자에게 복음을 전하게 하시려고 내게 기름을 부으시고 나를 보내사 포르된 자에게 자유를 눈먼 자에게 다시 보게 함을 전파하며 눌린 자를 자유케 하고 주의 은혜의 해를 전파하게 하려 하심이라 하였더라. <목소리> Then 
que los oprimidos serán puestos en libertad y que ha llegado el tiempo del favor del Señor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Edward Van der Heer. La palabra del Señor. Kalima Tarrab. Chunime Marsem. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning. My name is Carla Sanderson from Union University in Tennessee. Westmont College and Mark Sargent fit. Westmont has long been regarded for its place among the nation's top liberal arts colleges, but most importantly for us, for being a Christian college to which all the rest of us aspire to emulate. This institution could not have named a provost and dean of the faculty more fitted for this place than Mark Sargent. A leader among leaders in both Christian colleges and independent college worlds, Mark Sargent embodies Westmont College's commitment to thoughtful scholarship, grateful service, faithful leadership, and global engagement for the cause of Christ in the academy, in the church, and in the world. The Council for Independent Colleges, made up of just over 500 institutions across our country, recently named in 2008 Mark their, with their prestigious award, Chief Academic Officer. And in our own network of 172 colleges and affiliates around the world, Mark Sargent is regarded as the most valued CAO, Chief Academic Officer, for his wisdom and expertise and passion for our work, but also for his friendship and true colleagueship among us. Beginning with this Fulbright opportunity in the Netherlands, Dr. Sargent's career path from Biola to Spring Harbor to Gordon College seems to have prepared him well to come home to join Dr. Beebe in leading this remarkable college and to come alongside this esteemed faculty and student body in the pursuit of truth found in the life and meaning of ministry of Jesus Christ. I introduce to you today my friend and trusted colleague, and I assert to you this morning that you can trust him. You can expect him to be winsome and at the same time challenging you can expect him to accept and affirm you. You can expect Mark Sargent's forbearance and long suffering in his relationships with you. You can expect him to point you toward our great God, working hard for his pleasure and his glory. Dietrich Bonhoeffer's little book entitled Life Together describes for us the joy of common life life in community together as followers of Jesus Christ. It is my distinct honor to introduce to Westmont College one with whom the joy of common life will become known. Using Bonhoeffer's words, Mark Sargent will bring to Westmont College an understanding that the more genuine and deeper this common life becomes, the more clearly and purely Jesus Christ will become the one and only thing that is vital in this place. Because God has already laid the only foundation of our fellowship, because God has bound us together in one body with other Christians in Jesus Christ, long before we entered into the common life with them, we enter into that common life as thankful recipients. Westmont College can thank God for what he has done for you. You can thank God for giving this campus Mark Sargent, who will live by the call of God, by his forgiveness, and by his promise. Thank you. This is a charge um, from the faculty. 
For a few months now, I've been mulling over a wise adage from a field quite different from my own and quite different from your own, Mark. It is from the esteemed field of business and even more shockingly, from sales and marketing. Now, I have not taken a business class in seventh grade, nor have I had much affinity for business. I'm actually naturally suspicious of marketing. Uh, but my new husband is in technical software sales, and I've been hearing a lot of war stories from the sales front. He was talking about some of the key lessons he had learned from a mentor of his. This wise adage was one of them. It goes like this. Your job is to identify what doesn't work and to proactively seek solutions. But much more important than that, your job is to recognize and never forget what works really, really well. Now we can see how this would easily work very well in sales, but I think it has some sound advice for the academic as well. Red pen in hand, we are trained to see what needs to be fixed. We are trained to be critics. But don't get me wrong, I think the art of critique and analysis is certainly a noble one. It sharpens arguments, corrects mistakes, encourages healthy discussion, illuminates alternative perspectives, and reveals new and ambitious directions. Critical analysis and problem solving helps us be our best selves. Mark, as provost, this is certainly part of your job, and we faculty welcome you in this role. We welcome you as both a leader and as a partner, and we look forward to working in collaboration to make Westmont a Christ-centered learning community that continually strives for excellence in all we do. But just as important, my hope is that you will never lose sight of what works really, really well, and that you will enjoy it and savor it, and it will nourish you. Psalm 52 tells us about a person who puts their faith and trust in God. Verse 8 reads, But I am like an olive tree, flourishing in the house of God. I trust in God's unfailing love forever and ever. Mark, our hope and prayer as faculty is that Westmont will be a place where you will flourish and will, where you will prosper and grow in body, mind, and spirit, always leaning on God's unfailing love. Allow us to give to you as much as I know you want to give to us in service and in leadership. Read our books. Come to our lectures. Let us show you around our favorite city when you come visit us on an off-campus program. Listen to our research students as they walk you through their scientific posters. Enjoy our performances. Feast your eyes on our works of art. Cheer for our students at the weekend athletic event. Share a meal with us and let's not talk about business. Mark, let's celebrate and enjoy together the rich banquet that is Westmont College. We are so glad and grateful that you have joined us at this table for this wonderful feast. My parting advice to you is, don't forget to eat. <laughs> Mark. It is my privilege to stand before you on this occasion and offer you a charge on behalf of our students. It is also humbling to do this as I see you as a person who continues to teach and model for me and for so many across the nation what it means to serve as a chief academic officer of an institution. When I consider your role as provost, I am most drawn to the importance that we model for students what it means to be a whole person. To be people for whom life, the life of the mind, the heart, and the soul are woven intricately together into one. With that in mind, it is imperative that the faculty and the staff who most engage with students be people of character, of integrity, of compassion, and live in the likeness of Christ every day, in every way. It is also important that in our work together, students would see modeled for them the relationship between the class and in-class and out-of-class experiences and the partnerships we have come to enjoy at Westmont. Mark, I have always held you in high regard, 
and for decades have considered you a friend and an amazing colleague. It has been my pleasure and my wonder to now be able to partner with you in our common work at this amazing place called Westmont. I can't imagine anyone with whom I would rather share this partnership. So as I think about your time at Westmont, I want to encourage you to remember to one, not let the details of our existence here bog down your creativity, your innovative spirit, your vision for our work as a college. Two, to continue in your love for students and to locate ways that you can be a part of their lives. And three, to find sacred places of rest and renewal for your soul. So Mark, welcome to Westmont. It is a delight and a joy to partner with you in this amazing work.
Good morning, I'm Ron Mahuron. I am here representing the Council for Christian Colleges and Universities. It is my distinct privilege this morning to bring this charge to my colleague and dear friend, Mark Sargent, on behalf of the Council for Christian Colleges and Universities, representing the broader movement of Christian higher education, both here in North America and around the world. Mark, your life's work has been directed toward the deepest calling within the human soul, to know God and to embrace the wonders of his world through a life committed to the pursuit of truth, beauty, grace, and imagination. You have demonstrated this commitment through many years of faithful service, not only within the CCCU, but to the higher education community as a whole. That service as both scholar and leader is highly regarded and respected by peers across the country and around the world. The charge I bring to you this morning is to continue to expand the vision for global Christian higher education and to use your post here as provost at Westmont College to create spaces and places where people of all ages, backgrounds, and giftedness can be directed to their highest callings before God. The movement of Christian higher education needs your leadership to encourage us to think big, to be reminded of our frailties, to keep us honest, and to help all of us remember that we will never have all of the answers but that the pursuit of good answers requires equally good questions. Mark Sargent, I charge you to draw upon the many gifts with which you have been blessed to imagine new ways in which the Christian liberal arts can be revitalized in this moment of some doubt and even some fear about the times in which we live. Through your writing, your speaking, and your moral, moral imagination, be fearless. Bring us fresh insights. Help us to look beyond our own disciplines, our own denominations, or even our own institutional loyalties to see the world as our Lord Jesus Christ would have us see the world. And finally, Mark, I charge you to do all of this with your winsome, warm, and genuine wit. May God's abiding grace and deep love be evident in and through your life as you respond to his call and to this charge. Good morning, my name is Jim Sargent and I am Mark's younger brother by a couple of years. And I don't know if you have older brothers or sisters, but I have spent most of my life walking in his very large footsteps and it was intimidating, but I learned to use his successes and to draft off, draft off of his accomplishments to gain my confidence and uh, become a stronger person. And uh, it is really an honor for me to be here today to uh, speak uh, to him and uh, to charge him for this. However, uh, I almost, when he sent me the program, I almost did turn this down because on the program I realized I was to be followed by a video by my nephew, uh, Daniel, who many of you know. It's, it's one thing to be compared to your older brother, and I learned to deal with that. Uh, it's a little more intimidating to be compared to your nephew who is passing you by, so uh, uh, he will speak shortly. I have chosen to give my charge in the form of two gifts as I thought back uh, charging Mark from the Sargent family, and I have a couple of things I want to share. The first of these is a simple piece of ceramic tile. Our father was an artist. Uh, he may have been the only artist in the 1950s who quit art school to go to seminary in the Midwest and get a Master of Divinity degree. But uh, he was by heart and by skill an artist. Uh, by profession he was an educator, but uh, we grew up listening to my dad read us uh, Rudyard Kipling, Lewis Carroll, uh, Tennyson, poems at bed, and he was fantastic with his hands. And Mark and I did not uh, develop those skills, but uh, my father was a painter, 
and a carpenter, and uh, also did ceramic tile. And uh, Mark and I, one of our first jobs was doing uh, ceramic tile with our father. And I want to uh, give him this, hopefully to display in his office, to use as a reminder of the artistic temperament that uh, was put into us by our father and uh, what he contributed to our lives uh, in that area. The second gift I have is a school bell. Our mother colored between the lines and she ran our house on schedule. She was, not surprisingly, a kindergarten teacher for her career. Uh, and uh, this bell I have here is her retirement gift from her school district uh, for her years of service. And I have brought these two things to Mark. Uh, hopefully he can display them in his office. And sometime, somehow, some way, there will be a time when uh, he can draw on those skills for my parents to hopefully solve some of the problems. Uh, an artistic father and an administrative mother, and uh, that is probably about the challenge he faces. So, Mark, thank you for uh, being that brother for me and uh, providing leadership for me, and I wanted to leave these with you uh, for uh, mom and dad as a charge from the Sargent family. So, uh, God bless you. of complex cultures and places in remarkable ways. In your new role, I would encourage you to draw on your travel experiences and your time in Santa Barbara to keep interpreting the subtleties of the world around you. So may this experience call you to make deeper connections between the familiar and the new, the past and the present. And hopefully, you'll discover a few curiosities along the way. Proud of you, Dad. Congratulations from across the pond. Mark, it is with tremendous joy that we officially install you this morning as our provost and dean of faculty. Becoming provost at Westmont is an arduous process, and it's not meant to indicate what the job will be like, but simply the care and scrutiny with which we reach a decision. You come at an exciting juncture in our history. You bring with you an enormous wealth of talent, bedrock integrity, 30 years of experience in higher education, characterized by so many people who've worked with you and alongside of you as a person with tremendous energy, creativity, sound judgment, a person gracious in tone, but honest in assessment, always compassionate, but never pandering, always willing to help, but never condescending. Mark is an outstanding academic with a distinguished record of writing and research. His areas of core interest have been American literature, American history, and higher education. To read Mark is to sense that artistic spirit that his brother Jim just referred to, to feel the sense of his balance with words, and to sense the compulsion of his thoughts. He has also distinguished himself as a great administrator, well known for his ability to solve complex problems with innovative solutions. One individual with whom I spoke referred to Mark as, circumstances always seem to improve if Mark is involved. Honestly, what a great tribute. What will your role be as provost at Westmont? I decided to scour the definitions of a provost and there were many to choose from. Here are two of my favorites. From the French, a medieval term. A provost is one who collects taxes. <laughs> Serves as a military commander of an elite legion. Sits as a judge to arbitrate disputes. A second, perhaps more accurate definition. One who exercises leadership over the chapter of monks who have come both to study and pray. It reflects a sacred calling Collegial in its core, humble in its approach, relational in its nature. It combines an able intellect with a warm regard for all those who serve under you. Mark, you are a gracious embodiment of this second definition. 
And what lies ahead? We need our education to have a lasting impact on the students who are gathered here and the students who are yet to come. You will oversee the ever-expanding needs of our educational mission. The physicist Richard Feynman has summarized our current situation in education as one in which the understandings that we discover today only create new and expanding frontiers of ignorance because almost all of our discoveries lead to more and more complex questions. Our second challenge will be to educate our students to be adaptable, teaching them how to question and probe, to pursue reasoned statements and arguments, but to do so with a spirit of civility where we can learn together how to respond to those with whom we have profound disagreements without breaking and disrupting community and ruining the opportunity to be friends. Third, we'll need you to nourish our faculty, to encourage them in their teaching, their research, their scholarship, and the creative work they undertake on all fronts. Work with our deans, our program directors, and our department chairs as they seek to serve those under their care. And finally, we are inviting you to expand our global reach. The world has come to our doorstep, and it is our opportunity to expand our reach into the world. Mark, today is a day in which we honor you and celebrate your coming. Thank you for your service to higher education. Thank you for bringing your enormous gifts and gracious and humble spirit to Westmont. And now by the authority vested in me by the Board of Trustees, I hereby commission you as Provost and Dean of Faculty of Westmont College. Recognize this day, October 3rd, 2012, Santa Barbara, California. May God strengthen you in mind and spirit for all the great work that lies ahead. Thank you, President Beebe. Thank you, faculty. Uh, I'm ready to enjoy the feast. Mm -hmm. Thank you, friends and family, many of whom traveled quite a ways to be here today. I'm grateful for that. Uh, uh, this is a real honor for me. It's great to be able to share some of it with my family as well. Uh, it's hot. My time is short. So let me hurry to get at least one big word into this title talk today. It's actually a good liberal arts word since uh, it has Greek roots and is used in archaeology and art and now quite frequently in software design. And if nothing else, it is one killer word in Scrabble. <laughs> in fact, if you fit the right letters into the right slots and things lined up perfectly, you can score 311 points with skeuomorphism. <laughs> and what is skeuomorphism? Well, you are looking at it. You are looking at it when you see a computer screen that looks like movable pieces on a Scrabble board. Or when you type letters on your iPad and you hear the click click as if it were a typewriter, or you take a photo and it makes a click as if it's a sound. Or when you hold a Kindle and flip those pages. Skeuomorphism is when a product or device retains the features of a previous technology, features that are no longer functionally necessary. We all know that you can read a text by rolling on the screen, but somehow flipping those pages is reassuring, comforting. And skeuomorphism is actually the subject of a fierce controversy right now among software architects. A whole host of recent editorials have taken aim at Apple computers for their commitment, uh, an obsession, they said, of their previous CEO, Steve Jobs, to implement so many schemorphic devices in what they did. The issue is whether or not replicating the old, familiar looks in the new technologies is gimmicky or tacky, an effort to placate consumers and make them feel safe and comfortable, rather than using the technology to achieve what it can to promote learning and discovery. To be honest, uh, I like lots of nostalgia <laughs> in technology. Uh, I love those Toy Story movies. Anyone like Toy Story movies where you, it's 
first class digital technology, but it's like the toys from my generation, like Slinkies and Mr. Potato Head. Uh, the blend of nostalgia and innovation uh, can be fun at times. But a fierce part of the challenge for any chief academic officer these days is to discern what parts of our educational practice and what forms are merely ornamental or nostalgic, comforting because they are familiar, and what parts are enduring and vital. The challenge is so much more acute at a liberal arts college. We are increasingly a diminishing sector of higher education, and we are treated by some as, or viewed by some as ornamental, the privilege of a few rather than the vanguard of the future. So in the next couple minutes here at this beginning, this installation for me, let me highlight two enduring values of a liberal arts community that I think are life-giving and what I would like to see distinguish our community, our life together at Westmont. The first is civil conversation. I think Westmont can be a model of civil conversation. By civil, I mean both civility and civic. Conversation for the general good, common conversation for the common good. Liberal arts should be about cultivating citizenship. And in an age of sound bites and a lot of partisan rancor, we want conversation that is sustained, desiring understanding rather than victory in conversation. True, we need to sharpen one another's ideas with dispute, but we also want to synthesize. And one of the things that I think is most valuable about a liberal arts community is that we need to bring together the disciplines to talk about common problems and to show the, the benefits where we get the fruits of common uh, focus from different perspectives on a disciplinary um, or a particular issue. And I hope that kind of multidisciplinarity will distinguish us. I also want us to be a community of generous inquiry. This is the liberal part of the liberal arts, wide-ranging inquiry, the pursuit of knowledge that uh, is designed to be selfless rather than self-promoting. In a time when a lot of research is devoted to the proprietary interests of the people who sponsor it, the liberal arts tradition has supported research which is generous, scholars committing their work for the benefit of others, for other scholars to build on, scholarship that's disinterested, that's a gift to the community. I want it to be generous in another sense. I want it to be connected to service. Westmont has some very strong service traditions. I think we can enrich those traditions by tying things like Potter's Clay and the Emmaus Road more strongly to our students' research interests and development so that we can inform that kind of compassion and service with greater understanding and knowledge. And we need to make inquiry in a generous way at the center of the classroom experience. Uh, the classroom should not simply be about receiving knowledge. It should be about students learning to inquire and joining with us as common inquirers in our tasks. It also needs to be generous because a liberal arts degree is often seen as a badge of privilege. We talk about whole person education, which I thoroughly believe in, but whole education person is not simply the acquisition of knowledge to achieve status and power. Whole education person comes when we recognize the wholeness of others or what needs to be done to cultivate that wholeness. A few moments ago, my wife Arlene and three women read a passage from the gospel that evokes both past and present. Uh, and anticipates the future. Uh, I want you to consider that reading as a study in technology. The text was read in multiple languages to convey something of our interest of being global citizens. However, to prepare for this after or this morning, I actually copied the text. I googled the passage. I copied the text from a web page, uh, divided it into different languages by cutting and pasting, went to online parallel translations, uh, and helped divide the text. It took a few minutes. Technology can be wonderful. But uh, consider the technology in the scene from Luke that was read. When Jesus enters the synagogue, head covered, and waits for the religious officials to bring him the scroll of Isaiah, with the decorum and ceremony, he respectfully unrolls a dozen or so more sheets of parchment that had been stitched together to find the right place in the text. And it is not a digitized text that can be manipulated 
or searched, but only found through the careful, uh, del del careful work of the person that unrolls it. And it is the careful handiwork of a scribe, a scribe who quite possibly chose not to write the name of God out of a sense of humility and a sense of personal unworthiness. There's a sacredness to this scene, a sense of the tactile and the communal, an air of ritual and intimacy with other readers that can be lost when the text sometimes becomes digital and dislocated. It is not mere ornament. That sense of reverence in the midst of community is something that we need to pres preserve here at Westmont. But there's also a powerful idea that something provincial, the text of a Hebrew people during their own exile of captivity, now resonates throughout the world in many languages. That sense of an expanding gospel, expanding good news for service, is something we want to pursue. Luke's gospel certainly makes it clear that the mission of Jesus brings new life to an old vision without dismissing it. In many ways, the 600-year-old wisdom and vision of Isaiah has been embodied in new ways by Jesus' own calling and purpose. That prophecy comes in the latter part of the book of Isaiah, the so-called second Isaiah, the hopeful end of a book that is looking forward to the people's escape from captivity. Jesus picks up that theme at a time when his own people were experiencing their own sense of control by the Romans and takes the image of the suffering servant in Isaiah and represents it in a his time. In many ways, I think our challenge at Westmont as a liberal arts college is to continue that tradition, to seize that vision that Christ embodied, to care for the brokenhearted, to serve the refugee, to look for those that are broken, and to use all the innovation and skills uh, that we have coming out of our own multidisciplinary liberal arts tradition to serve that need. That's our challenge. We're heirs of that challenge. And my hope is that Westmont will be a place that will preserve what is sacred and dignified and communal in midst of rapid change and convenience. That our conversation will be not only civil but synthesizing, drawing together the best of our ideas to serve a, a greater good. That we can preserve the liberal arts not as an embodiment of our privilege but as a prompt for curiosity and discovery that can serve to lift people out of injustices and misfortunes and spiritual hopelessness. And it's for that challenge that I am pleased to devote the next years of my life as your friend. God bless you. Would you please stand? Let us pray. Well, Lord, here we are at the end of one service, but the launching of another. And for both, we give you thanks. Thanks for this time together for one thing, to honor this, your servant in these days, and to prepare him for the work that is still to come. For his multiple gifts, we give you thanks. For his willingness to use those gifts to serve you in this season, we praise your name. Lord, we ask your blessing on Mark today in the days to come, on Mark, Arlene, their family, and on this community that now gratefully surrounds them. Bless him and protect him as well from worries which are unnecessary, from mountains which are not his to climb. Help him to remember that his finitude is not his curse, but your blessing, equipping him for his part in this ministry. Help us, Lord, each one of us, to play our part as well, to join this symphony with this new conductor to play those compositions that you have given us, to the end that this community, indeed this world, might hear your voice and sing your song to the glory of your name. Amen.
Please join in singing the recessional hymn. Come, thou fount of every blessing, tune thy heart to sing thy grace, streams of mercy.